Wait, actually. <clears throat> All right. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, this is another uh, seminar in the in scientific machine learning e seminar series that we have. And it's my true pleasure to introduce um, Professor Human Ohadi. Um, Dr. Ohadi is a professor of applied and computational mathematics in, in control and dynamical systems at Caltech. Um, his interests include uh, uncertain quantification, numerical ap approximation, statistical inference, learning, data simulation, stochastic, and multi scale analysis. And his recent work in blurring the boundaries between computational science and machine learning is fascinating. And his particular focus is on so, um, solving numerical approximation problems as learning problems and learning problems as numerical approximation problems. Um, and he has he was a plenary speaker at the uh, SIAM CSC 2015 and to Terry Speaker Sam UQ 2016 and a recipient of numerous uh, uh, awards and his research is supported by um, uh, many, many organizations, DARPA, De Department of Energy, uh, Los Alamos National Lab, um, uh, National Nuclear Security Administration and NSF. And uh, today's uh, talk is about um, solving linear, solving and learning nonlinear PDEs and completing computational graphs with Gaussian processes. With that, uh, Human, please take it away. Um, thank you, Hassan. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. So I'm hiding my control panel so I don't see the chat box. So please, uh, if you have any questions, interrupt me. And if you want to make this seminar interactive, don't hesitate to in interrupt me and ask me to, to ask me any question that you, you want, okay? And I, I can adjust the flow of this talk and I can basically skip parts or cover some more or other parts in details. So um, I will start by uh, presenting a Gaussian process method for solving arbitrary nonlinear PDEs. And then I will show that this method can be seen as part of a larger one for completing computational graphs with Gaussian pr processes. Uh, the main point that I will try to make is that this larger framework can be used as a pocket calculator for reducing the complexity of most problems in computational sciences and engineering. Now, there are essentially two main learning approaches to solving PDEs. Approaches based on artificial neural networks with physics informed neural networks as a prototypical example, and approaches based on Gaussian processes with gamblets as a prototypical example. Although the Gaussian process approach is more theoretically well-founded and has a long history of interplays with numerical approximation, and although it leads to efficient uh, solvers for multi-scale PDEs, it was, essentially limited to linear, quasi-linear, time-dependent PDEs. So <clears throat> what I will describe in the first part of this talk is a generalization of the GP approach to arbitrary nonlinear PDEs. This generalization is a joint work with Yifan Chen, Bamdan Hosseini, and Andrew Stewart. And the method that we have obtained from this generalization has several uh, desirable properties. Um, it is probably convergent for forward problems. It is interpretable and amenable to numerical analysis. You can use it to solve both forward and inverse problems. It inherits the complexity of state-of-the-art solvers for inverting dense candle matrices. And it can be used to develop a theoretical understanding of ANN-based methods. <clears throat> now, this GP method can be applied to arbitrary nonlinear PDEs, but for ease of presentation, I will describe it first for the following nonlinear elliptic PDE in which f, g, and tau are continuous functions such that this PDE has a unique strong solution. So the nonlinearity in this PDE is tau, which we assume to be continuous. And as an example, you can take tau of u to be u cubed. And again, this method, what I'm going to describe, generalizes to arbitrary nonlinear PDEs. 
Then, given the kernel K uh, defined on the domain omega, the proposed approach is to approximate the solution U dagger of the PDE with a function U minimizing the following nonlinear optimal recovery problem, in which the quantity to be minimized is the RKHS norm of the function U defined by the kernel K. And the constraints are requiring U to satisfy the PDE at a finite number of collocation points uh, in the interior of the domain and on the boundary. Note that the PDE constraints at those collocation points depend on whether they are located in the interior or on the boundary. Then we have the following theorem. Assume that the kernel K is chosen so that its reproducing kernel Hibbert space is continuously embedded in the subolef space HS for some S greater than D over two plus the order of the PDE, which is two here. We need that condition to ensure that the PDE can be defined pointwise for the element of that RKHS. Assume that the solution of the PDE belongs to that RKHS, and assume that the field distance between collocation points goes to zero as the number n of those collocation points goes to infinity. Then, as n goes to infinity, the approximation new n identified by our method converges to the solution of the PDE, where the convergence holds point pointwise in the domain and in HT for all t smaller than s. So this term is essentially saying that the proposed method is guaranteed to converge as the collocation points become dense in the domain if the kernel K is adapted in the sense that the solution belongs to the RKHS space defined by the kernel K, and that space has enough regularity to be embedded in a space containing functions with continuous second order derivatives. Now, I will present the proof of this theorem, not only because it is simple, but also because it generalizes to arbitrary nonlinear PDEs and it reveals a fundamental mechanism supporting kernel methods. So first observe that since uh, U dagger is the solution of our PDE, and since U dagger belongs to the RKHS space associated with our kernel K, U dagger is going to satisfy the optimization constraints of a nonlinear optimal recovery problem. Now, since UN is a minimizer of a nonlinear optimal recovery problem, we deduce that the RKHS norm of UN must be smaller than the RKHS norm of U dagger. Now, since the RKHS space defined by the kernel K is continuously embedded in HS, we have the following inequality holding for all functions F, and therefore, we deduce that the HS norm of UN must be uniformly bounded in N by constant C times the RKHS norm of U dagger. Now, we know that uh, for T between S and D over 2 plus 2, uh, the subless space HS is compactly embedded in the subless space HT. Therefore, we deduce that UN converges towards some limit in HT and in C2 along some, sub, some uh, subsequence. Now, we know that along that subsequence, UN is going to satisfy the PDE at collocation points. And we know that the field distance between those collocation points goes to zero as N goes to infinity. And then we therefore conclude that the limit must be a strong solution of the PDE. And because this limit is independent of the particular subsequence, we get convergence. So you have a very simple proof, a guarantee of convergence with kind of methods for arbitrary nonlinear PDs. Now, for the practical implementation of this method, this infinite dimensional variational problem can be reduced to a finite dimensional one by introducing the slack variable Z corresponding to the values of U at collocation points and its Laplacian at collocation points and then minimizing over U before minimizing over Z. Now, the minimization over U is a linear optimal recovery problem for which we have the following representative formula, which I will now unpack. So in that formula, Z 
is a vector obtained by concatenating the slack variables z1 and z2 corresponding to the values of u and its Laplacian at collocation points. To describe the other terms, I would write phi for the vector uh, whose entries phi i's are delta Dirac functions at the collocation points xi, or delta Dirac functions composed with the Laplacian operator at the collocation points xi. Kx phi is a vector whose entries are obtained by integrating the kernel k at the point uh, x against uh, the function phi i. And k phi phi is a matrix whose entries are obtained by integrating the kernel k against these functions phi i's and phi j's. So according to this formula, to identify u, we only need to identify the slack variables z. And these variables are identified by plugging this representative theorem into the previous optimization problem, and then which then reduces to the following finite dimensional optimization problem over z. Okay. Now, to reduce this, uh, uh, to solve this reduced finite dimensional constraint optimization problem, we use the constraints to eliminate one of the optimization variables, which here is the vector z2, whose entries are the values of the Laplacian of u at the collocation points. And we turn this nonlinearly constrained quadratic optimization problem into an unconstrained non-quadratic optimization problem. Now, to solve this unconstrained optimization problem, we simply use the variant of the Gauss-Newton algorithm. This algorithm is an iterative algorithm by successively linearizing the nonlinearity tau around the previous approximation of the solution and by solving a quadratic optimization problem to get the next approximation of the solution. In practice, this Gauss-Newton algorithm converges in two to seven steps, which means that the complexity of our nonlinear solvers inherits the complexity of inverting dense scalar matrix matrices, and we are currently adapting the algorithm found on this paper to do so in near linear complexity. Now, this Gauss-Newton iteration is equivalent to solving successive linearizations of the underlying nonlinear PDE, which is uh, equivalent to solving a nonlinear PDE with a combination of Newton's iteration with a kernel or gamblet method for the linearized part. The following numerical experiments compare the convergence of the finite difference method uh, with the convergence of the proposed method using a Gaussian kernel. So you get convergence to machine precision, which is something that you typically do not see with ANN based methods. Now, as mentioned before, this method and its convergence theorem generalized to arbitrary nonlinear PDEs. And as an example, these figures illustrate the accuracy of the method uh, for Berger's equation when using the following anisotropic kernel in which the length scale of space has been chosen to be smaller than the length scale for time to capture the underlying shock being developed in the solution in space. Um, these figures and this table show the accuracy of the method for Iconal's equation with the Gaussian kernel. And here our Gauss-Newton algorithm converges in six steps. Now, this method can naturally be extended to inverse problems. As an example, consider the problem of approximating the solution u and the coefficient a of the following PDE, given the values of u at a finite number of collocation points, which are colored in pink in this uh, figure. We have about 40 of them. Then the proposed generalization is to simply recover the solution u and the coefficient a of the PDE, by minimizing the sum of the square of their RKHS norms with respect to possibly two different kernels, K and gamma, um, subject to the PDE being satisfied at a, a finite number of collocation points in the interior of the domain, which are colored in blue here, and on the boundary, which are colored in orange, 
and also subject to our measurement of the value of the solution at the data or measurement points, and those points are colored in pink here again. Okay. Now, these figures show the true and recovered solution of the PDE and the true and recovered conductivity coefficient of the PDE. Uh, the underlying gas Newton algorithm converges in five steps. Note that here we are solving both the forward and inverse problem at the same time, whereas the classical MCMC approach is to iterate between solving the PDE and solving the inverse problem. Uh, furthermore, again, the complexity of the method inherits that of inverting dance scanner matrices, so it is much faster than just waiting for MCMC to converge. Now, my next step will be to show that the proposed method can be seen as part of a more general framework and as completing computational graphs with Gaussian processes. Uh, to describe this, observe that solving a PDE can be expressed as comp com completing a comp computational graph. Consider the initial nonlinear elliptic PDE as an example, and observe that solving that PDE is equivalent to identifying the unknown function u in the following computational graph, where nodes represent variables and edges represent functions, with unknown functions colored in red and non-functions colored in black. So for that graph, for that graph, u is mapping a point x of the domain to the vector formed by u of x and minus Laplace of u of x. And that vector is mapped to the right-hand side of the PDE by a non-function representing the structure of the PDE itself. Now the proposed approach can be expressed as replacing the unknown function u in that graph by a Gaussian process with kernel k and computing its map estimator given the data. Here, the data is represented using uh, dashed arrows and it corresponds to the observation of the right-hand side of the PDE at the interior collocation points and the observation of, this, uh, of its solution at the boundary collocation points. Uh, now consider the problem of solving and learning the following PDE in which the coefficient a is an unknown function. Then approximating u and a can be formulated as completing the following computational graph in which the unknown functions are both u and a. And the previous approach can then be expressed as replacing these unknown functions by independent GPs and computing their map estimator from the data. Here, the data corresponds to the observation of the right-hand side of the PDE at the interior collocation points and the observation of its solution at the boundary and the measurement points. Okay. The main point here is that once you have drawn that graph, then its completion can be fully automated as an algorithm. Now, why is this important? Why should we care? Uh, to answer these questions, I will make a few observations. Uh, this was life before AutoCAD. This was also life before AutoCAD. And this is life after AutoCAD. Computing square root of two is hard if you do it by hand, but, but simple if you use, use a pocket calculator. You just do it without thinking about it. Calculating a mortgage amortization schedule is hard if you do it by hand, but simple if you do it with, Excel, with an Excel sheet. Why? Because the complexity of a problem is relative to our ability to decompose it by reasoning through simple concepts, encapsulating and abstracting away its technicalities. And if you automate the resolution of those technicalities, then you are only left with manipulating high-level concepts, and you are therefore free to perform tasks of significantly higher importance and complexity. Question, can the same thing be done with most problems in computational sciences and engineering? I will now um, suggest that uh, this question 
may have a positive answer to the observation that most problems in computational sciences and engineering can be formulated as completing a computational graph representing functional dependencies between partially known or unknown functions and variables. Drawing the graph is the high level reasoning part. Completing the graph is something that can be automated. And I will try to make this point by considering a few other problems. But the point is that if you had an army of software engineers, you will ask them to automate the completion of the graph and all you will do is just drawing graphs on an iPad. Nothing else. Okay. So I will try to make this point by considering a few other applications. And the, the, the first application is uh, going to concern the identification of the digital twin or surrogate model of this electric circuit whose RLC components are assumed to be unknown and nonlinear. We also assume that all the voltages and currents in the circuit to be unknown functions of time. Now, we run this circuit between time zero and time 10, and at times Ts equal to S over 10, uh, for S going from zero to 99, we observe a measure, a subset of the variables representing the state of the circuit. This figure, shows the values of the voltage V1 at the times when, when those values are observed. So we make a total of seven observations or measurements on V1. Now, given those measurements, consider the problem of approximating all the unknown functions, identifying the RLC parameters as functions of currents and voltages, and identifying all the currents and voltages as a function of time. Um, these figures show the values of the measured variables at time when they are measured. Observe that compared to a traditional reg regression problem, the data is too scarce to uh, recover any of those functions independently from, from each other, from the others. To recover them, we have to exploit known dependencies between functions and variables. So as you were mentioning, Hassan, here we are in a data pool regime. And we cannot just simply uh, regress those points with any kernel. Now, to exploit the known dependencies between these functions and these variables, uh, I'm going to write x for the vector whose entries are the variables representing the state of the system. Observe that these variables are related to each other through known functional dependencies given by the following equations which are the Kirchhoff laws for this nonlinear electric circuit. Now, we can represent these functional dependencies between variables as a graph, where nodes represent variables and directed edges represent functions, with unknown functions colored in red and known functions colored in black. And our solution is to replace unknown functions by GPs and compute their map estimator given the data and dependencies. And once you have the graph, again, the rest is just you turning the crank or having a software doing it for you. And these figures show the true and recovered functions using this approach. So this method works surprisingly well, given that the data was quite scarce, right? You have to compare these figures with these ones. Okay. Now, uh, I will unpack the completion method once more, um, which again is the technical part that can be abstracted away and fully automated. To do so, we'll formalize the representation of the data. Remember that we run the circuit between time zero and time uh, 10, and at time Ts equals s over 10, for s going from time zero to 99, we observe or measure a subset of the variables of the graph. Now, if for each one of those samples indexed by S, we write XSV for the value of the variable V in that sample S, then XSV can be seen as the entry SV of some matrix that has 100 rows because we have 100 samples and 14 columns because we are tracking 14 variables. Now, for each one of those samples, we only observe a subset of the variables 
which means that we only observe a subset of the, of the entries of that matrix X. Those entries are colored in white in the following figure. For instance, in sample five, we observe uh, the variables T, V1, I1, and L1 of I1 at that time T. Uh, for sample 58, uh, for sample 58, we observe T, R of I3, and EV3 over uh, DT. For sample 70, which corresponds to this row, we observe T, I2, and V3. Now, again, our solution is to replace unknown functions by GPs and compute their map estimator given the data. To describe this, we write F for the vector whose entries are the unknown functions to be identified. And we write M for the Boolean matrix whose entry as V is equal to one if variable V is observed in sample S and zero otherwise. And using Python language notations, we write X of M for the entries of the matrix X that are observed or measured. Note that the underlying problem combines a regression problem that is recovering the unknown functions of the graph with a matrix completion problem that is finding the missing entries of that matrix X. Furthermore, it, can, it is equivalent or it can be thought of as solving nonlinear systems of equations involving unknown functions and variables. Now, to approximate the unknown functions and complete the matrix X, we minimize the following loss in which Z is our candidate for the matrix uh, X. And now I will unpack that loss. Um, the square norm of F is the sum of the squares of the RKHS norms of the unknown functions with respect to the following Gaussian kernel. Uh, note that this kernel does not add any prior information on those functions besides regularity. The L1 term in the loss enforces dependencies between non-function and non-functions and variables. For instance, the term highlighted in green uh, enforces the constraint that the variable uh, representing the value uh, V1 is obtained by mapping the variable t via the unknown function v1. The L2 term in the loss enforces dependencies between known functions and variables. So for instance, that term highlighted in green enforces the constraint that the variables representing the values of i1, i2, and i3, which are the currents, uh, must be such that i1 plus i3 minus i2 is equal to zero. And the last term in the loss enforces the constraint imposed by the data. Note that uh, the terms L1, L2, and L3 are soft constraints, which can be turned into hard constraints as you take this long bus to infinity, or as in classical Gaussian process regression, instead of considering the relaxed problem, you can take your nuggets to zero, and then you get a, you get a hard constraint optimization problem. Now, to minimize the overall loss, we minimize our unknown functions first. And since this problem is quadratic uh, in these unknown functions, we have, the, we have representative formulas representing those minimizers as functions of the unknown variable Z. For instance, for the unknown, uh, for the unknown function V1, notice that V1 appears in these two terms. Note that the overall loss is quadratic in V1, and minimizing V1 given the variable Z is equivalent to solving a kernel ridge regression problem whose minimizer is given by the following formula. And if you do the same for all unknown functions, then you can reduce the previous uh, infinite dimensional optimization problem to one that depends only on Z and uh, that you can minimize with variance of gradient descent or Gauss Newton. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, go ahead. So, uh... Here we have nonlinear constraints here, and the uh, prior is a Gaussian. And um, so, do we expect that? I mean, what, what happens to the posterior? Is the posterior is also Gaussian because of the nonlinearity? And so like, I wonder what happens to the uncertainty estimates. That's a very good question. So, the posterior is non Gaussian. The overall posterior on the unknown functions is non Gaussian uh, because of the nonlinear constraints. This being said, 
condition on those variables z, on those slack variables z, the posteriors of all these unknown functions are Gaussian. Mm -hmm. So once, if you know how to sample from this slack variable z, mm -hmm. then you know how to sample from these functions because the second step is you just sampling from a Gaussian distribution. I see, okay, but condition on that. that condition on z, no. yeah, the, 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 the functions have a posterior distribution that is Gaussian. So, but the distribution of z itself is non-Gaussian mm. because of the, of the constraints. So, may I ask a question too? Please. Uh, so for the loss function that you're writing on the very top, right? So is this some sort of a, like a penalty method and Lagrange multipliers? Uh, it, it is it is equivalent to it, it is like a penalty method. It is equivalent to you taking those constraints, uh, the Kirchhoff laws. So here you have hard constraints, right, in the Kirchhoff right. laws. Mm -hmm. So what I wrote is equivalent to replacing this zero by a by a Gaussian random variable, mm -hmm. which is just a noise. So basically, what I wrote this relaxation is equivalent to relaxing all these inequalities or these equalities by making them noisy. Okay. And you don't have to do it. You can, uh, as you know, that you can work with hard constraints with GPs. You can also work with hard card constraints here. The, the reason why you relaxation is nice is because it, it's, it, as you increase the number of data points, you dense scalar dense matrices become large and they can become poorly conditioned. And to avoid <laughs> issues with that, you typically add nuggets as you do in classical regression. All right, so then alpha one, uh, lambda one, lambda two, lambda, yes. lambda three, how are you determining those ones? Ah, 1,000. 1,000? I take them to be 1,000. 1,000, okay. Uh, but okay. so in practice, you you just took them to be large enough so that your code is stable. Okay. I mean, why not you say augmented Lagrangian method, for instance, so that this thing actually happens naturally? You you could that. you could you could that you could do that if you want to try to enforce those constraints exactly. Okay. I didn't because this method works well enough if you just uh, take lambdas of the order of one thousand. All right. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Matt, uh, you had another question. Uh, Masood, you had raised your hand. You want to go ahead and ask your question? Sure, thank you so much. Uh, I have a quick question for you. Uh, so uh, in the circuit, uh, electrical circuit theory, you are able to solve that uh, RLC circuit with, in the continuous domain and also in the discrete domain. And uh, so uh, my question is that why uh, you actually, uh, I, I didn't get the motivation of uh, this method because we already have some tools and uh, uh, methods and uh, a strong uh, background on this topic. And uh, in a sense that we can, we are able to solve this problem, RSC problem uh, in the continuous domain and also in the discrete domain, if we have the sinusoidal uh, voltage sources. Yeah. So, so the only thing that I'm trying to do here is to give a motivation for this graph completion framework. And all I'm saying is that at the end of the day, um, the, this framework allows you to separate the conceptual part of your problem from its technical part. The conceptual part is just drawing the, the, the graph and the technical part is completing the graph. I will show you applications to more complex problems for which the solutions are not that trivial, but this is just a simple example. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Okay. So le let me show you these other examples. Um, okay, before I do so, let me just mention that uh, you can represent, uh, you, evidently you can represent classical interpolation as a, as a graph completion problem. Okay. 
you can also represent regression as a graph completion problem by adding noise to the observation of the output variables. The variables of the graph may be uh, known, unknown, or random, and I will color those random variables in blue. Uh, you can also represent dimension reduction problems as graph completion problems. So in this graph, the dimension of the intermediate variable Z is smaller than that of X and Y, <coughs> which must live in the same space. And if you complete this graph with GPs, <coughs> you get a kernelized and regularized variant of autoencoders. And if you select the underlying kernels to be linear, then you will discover PCA and its regularized variants. You can also represent a non-linear active subspace modeling as graph completion problems. Uh, in this graph, uh, the dimension of the intermediate variable Z is smaller than that of X and Y, which may not live in the same space. And if you use linear kernels for the unknown functions, then you recover, you will discover SVD and its regularized variance. Okay. Now, one important question is how do you choose the underlying kernels? Well, you can learn those kernels from the data itself. You can inform them about the physics, or you can program them from the data by learning the structure of the graph itself from data. So the design of the graph can be dynamic. And I will now cover those answers, um, starting with the first one. I will do so in the uh, setting of the following interpolation problem in which you seek to approximate an unknown function u uh, given its uh, values yi at some points, a defined number of points xi. So uh, as you know, the classical Krieg and Gaussian process regression solution to this problem is to interpolate the data with a linear combination involving some kernel k supported at the input data points xi and some coefficient ci identified by enforcing uh, the interpolation constraints defined by the input output data points xi and yi. Now, any non degenerate kernel could be used to interpolate the data exactly. So one immediate question is, which kernel do we pick? Well, I will now describe an algorithm called kernel flow, whose objective is to learn the kernel from the data itself via a variant of cross-validation. This algorithm is based on the simple premise that the kernel is good if subsampling the data does not impact the interpolant much. To quantify this, you interpolate the data with n points and your kernel k, and you call the interpolant v. You interpolate half of those points with the kernel k, and you call the interpolant w. Then you write rho for the relative error between the two interplants, where the norm used here is the RKHS norm defined by the kernel k. Then you use that rho uh, as a measure of goodness in the sense that you call a kernel good if this cross-validation loss rho is small. And I will now describe how this algorithm is implemented in practice. So assume that we are given a family of kernels k parameterized by alpha, some parameter alpha, which may be high dimensional. And you would like to find a good parameter alpha to use in your interpolation problem. Now to describe the iterations of this algorithm, let these red points represent all your data points. Select a random batch of these red points and color them in blue. Select a random sub batch of these points and color them in green. Interpolate the uh, blue points with the kernel k uh, with a pair parameter alpha and call the interpolant v. And interpolate the green points uh, with the same kernel k with a pair parameter alpha and call the interpolant w. And then evolve alpha in the gradient descent direction of rho, okay, where rho is the, again, the relative error between the two interpolants. And then iterate. Okay, so it's a very simple algorithm. Now, to illustrate this algorithm, I will consider the following extrapolation problem in which given the observation of the time series Z1, Z2, Zn up to time n, we want to predict the future states Zn plus one, Zn plus two, et cetera. 
Evidently, to, so, to solve such a problem, you need to make some assumptions. And the assumption that we'll make here is that the ZK can be obtained as the solution of some uh, unknown dynamical system with an unknown vector field F dagger and an unknown time delay to dagger. As you, you can imagine, this is a fundamental problem which has received a large amount of attention from the perspective of some wonderful methods, ranging from operator theory, equipment, sparse approximation to various variants of artificial neural networks. And all I want to do here is to show you the simplest possible kernel-based solution you can imagine. And what I'm going to show you can be found in the following paper with Boumedin Hamsi. So this solution is to approximate the vector field F dagger with a kernel interpolant, and then use that kernel interpolant as an emulator that is a surrogate dynamical system for predicting the future states of this uh, time series. So to implement this method, you give yourself a kernel key, then you use the past states of uh, your uh, time series uh, to construct input output data points. You interpolate those input output data points with your kernel key, and then you use that interpolant as the vector field of your surrogate dynamical system, and you predict the future states. And for the sake of time, I'm restricting the presentation to the case where the time delay to dagger is uh, known, and I refer to this paper for how, for how we learn it in practice. Okay, so how well does it work? Well, to answer that question, let us look at, a, at the following example in which a time series is produced by the solution of the Bernoulli map, which is a chaotic dynamical system. And the kernel K is the following Gaussian kernel. This figure shows in red the true dynamic and in blue the predicted dynamic. So it does not work well. Well, now let us add a little twist to this experiment. Let us also learn the kernel K used for creating this surrogate model. What do I mean? Well, for that example, what I mean is that instead of considering that particular given kernel K, we consider a family of kernels K parameterized by four parameters. And we also learn those parameters from the data before regressing the uh, target vector field F dagger. We learn them using the kernel flow algorithm, which I've already described. This figure shows the true dynamic in red and the predicted dynamic in blue, and they are indistinguishable in eyeball norm. Okay, now let's move on to another example. This example is the Henon map. And uh, to predict, uh, its future states, we approximate its vector field by interpolating the past data with this vector valued kernel. This kernel is diagonal with each diagonal, um, and each diagonal entry is a scalar valued kernel with six parameters. So we have a total of 12 parameters to learn, and we learn those parameters using kernel flows. The left figure shows the true and predicted dynamic with the learned kernel, and again, there is no difference in eyeball norm. The right figure shows the prediction error with the initial kernel in red and with the learned kernel in blue. And as you can see, the error drops by several orders of magnitude. This really highlights the importance of learning the underlying kernels when for kernel methods. Can I ask you a question? Yes. So we can formulate the same way and set these parameters as hyperparameters in a, like a maximum likelihood, mm -hmm. method, right? So the way people you know, find the correlation length, yes. right? So what would be the difference between learning it this way with kernel flows and just formulating it as a maximum likelihood? That's, that's a very good question. So when you use the maximum likely, likelihood method, you are essentially being a Bayesian. So you are making a prior on what your target function is. Or, or, and the target function is what is giving you your data, right? If your prior is correct on the distribution of the target function, then MLE is going to be optimal. But if that prior is not correct, MLE can be non-robust. That's right. Whereas cross-validation is going to, to have some degree of robustness. So the model of the story is that if you are well-specified, uh, MLE is going to be optimal and cross-validation is going to be near optimal. But you are, if you are misspecified, cross-validation is going to still give you something robust. Why? because you're not trying to infer the kernel in two steps where you assume that there is a true model parameterized by alpha and that, that alpha is what is producing mm -hmm. your data. You directly work with the interpolant. That's right. That's what gives uh, cross validation its robustness. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there are papers by Stein and Wahaba in the 90s. Uh, also have a recent paper with, um, I think I mentioned it earlier with uh, Yifan Chen and Andrew Stewart where we compare MLE with cross validation. 
And all of these papers come to the same conclusion that I just mentioned. Okay, very interesting. And uh, um, all right, I'll let you go and then I'll keep my questions for the end. Okay, now let us look at this other example uh, uh, in which a time series is three dimensional and a solution of the Lorentz dynamical system. Our vector valued kernel is diagonal as before uh, with the following diagonal entry. So it has 18 parameters to learn. And we learn those parameters with uh, kernel flows. And these figures show the true dynamic and the the dynamic for the three components of the dynamical system. So as you can see, there is no difference between them. Now, this method is not limited to synthetic problems. In this joint work with uh, Romit Molek from Argonne National Lab, we use this method to extrapolate weather slash climate time series obtained from satellite data. We compare the proposed kernel-based method with two PDE-based methods, HICOM and CSM, and an architecture-optimized uh, LSTM method, which is an artificial neural network method. HICOM took 800 core hours per day of forecast on the Cray XC40 uh, system. Uh, CESM took 17 million core hours on Yellowstone and CARS high performance computing resource. The arch architecture optimized LSTM took three hours of wall time on 128 compute nodes of the Teta supercomputer. And our simple kernel based method took 40 seconds to train uh, on a single node machine, a laptop without acceleration. Now, for the NOAA dataset, which is a low noise dataset, our kernel based method and the LSTM method have comparable accuracies. And these accuracies are significantly better than those of the PDE-based models. And for the NAND dataset, which is a high noise dataset, the uh, LSTM method has poor accuracy, while our simple kernel-based method remains accurate. So these uh, results have been obtained. So essentially these results have been obtained uh, by learning the drift of an underlying deterministic dynamical system, okay, from data. Uh, you can also learn or solve the problem of learning the drift and diffusivity term of an underlying stochastic differential uh, equation from the observation of one single trajectory and um, this is a joint work with uh, Mathieu Darcy, Boubidin Hamzi, uh, Livieri, uh, and Payman Tavalali. And the basic idea is to essentially discretize USDE with a Euler discretization scheme and represent the computational graph or draw the computational graph associated with this Euler discretization scheme. Now, in that graph, the the vector field F and the diffusion term sigma are the unknown functions. And you have, you observe the time series up to the present and you can use that data to complete the map estimators of F and sigma, okay? Now, I am beyond time, so I have a question for you, Esam. I can continue by showing other applications or I can stop here and take questions. Uh Maybe maybe we can do one more application and then we'll we'll stop for for taking questions. Okay. Because we we interrupted you a lot uh, during the presentation. So okay. how about going for five more minutes okay. and then we'll stop for. So the two other applications are to model decomposition and to uh, art to the um, analysis of artificial neural networks. I will just cover the one related to model decomposition. So in this uh, the, in this model decomposition problem, you have a signal v, and uh, given the, that's this, and you are told that this signal is the sum of four modes. You don't know what those modes are and you try to recover them, right? From the observation of the signal itself. Well, you can write this as a computational graph uh, completion problem in which the unknown functions are these modes, V1, V2, V3, and V4, okay? Uh, now, this is obviously an ill-post problem. And if you want the method to work, which is and the method which is to replace these unknown modes by GPs, you need to inform the kernels of these GPs about the structure of the modes that they are representing. Well, as an example, assume that you have the information that the first two modes are quasi-trigonometric with slowly varying unknown amplitudes, uh, that the third mode is a smooth signal and the last one is noise. Then you can identify the kernels corresponding to, uh, to these modes uh, by replacing the unknown amplitudes 
of the first two modes by smooth GPs, the third mode by a smooth GP, and the last mode by uh, white noise. Note that this method is, in fact, a simple regularization of the Tikhonov regularization, a simple generalization of the Tikhonov regularization, and it works quite well as suggested by the following figures, showing the true and recovered modes. Now let's look at a harder problem known as empirical mode decomposition, which goes back to Huang. So in this problem, you observe a signal uh, V composed of an, unnumber, of, an, of an unknown number M of modes. And the only thing that you know about the modes is that they are quasi-trigonometric with slowly varying amplitudes and frequencies. And those uh, amplitudes and frequencies are unknown. Now, one way to solve this problem is to program the underlying kernel from the data itself. And this is something that I'm going to describe now. So the first step in this prog programming process is to decompose the signal V, not over discourse modes, but over finer modes living in the linear span of GABA of wavelets, which are essentially uh, window trigonometric functions characterized by a, time, uh, by a time tau and a frequency omega. To Identify uh, the kernel of each fine mode, you simply replace the unknown coefficients in front of your gamma of wavelets by white noise, and you identify the covariance of the resulting uh, GPC uh, indexed by time and frequency and serving as a randomized surrogate for the corresponding fine modes indexed by the same time and the same frequency. And this is what these kernels look like. Then you can approximate the fine modes VT omega by computing the conditional expectation of the GPC to omega, given that their sum must be the signal V. But the main point in doing so is not to recover those mind modes, those fine modes, but to quantify how much each one of them contributes to the overall signal. Um, this can be done by computing their inner product between each recovered fine mode with the overall signal. And from the GP perspective, uh, this is equivalent to quantifying how much each underlying GP or fine mode GP C has been activated by computing its conditional inner product with the signal V. Uh, this is what this conditional inner product looks like uh, as a function of uh, time and frequency. And it essentially reveals the presence of three coarse modes in the signal, which are the modes that we are trying to recover. Uh, the kernel for those course modes can be identified by using this figure to partition the time frequency domain into three subsets, A1, A2, and A3, and identifying the kernel of the course mode I as the sum of the fine mode kernels over tau and omega in AI. And these figures show the true and recovered modes, so the method uh, has near machine precision. And there is last application to ResNets, but I don't have the time to show it. So I will stop here and we'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Human, for, for an excellent talk. Um, so we open the floor to questions from the audience. You can either raise your hand or you can just speak up. Uh, hi, Dr. Human. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I had a question about the convergence theorem. Uh, I think you assumed uh, smooth solution and proved convergence in uh, some functional spaces. I was wondering if you could apply a GP for um, some for discontinuous PDEs like inviscid Berger's equation or interface problems. Um, okay. So you need the right kernel for that. So let me answer this and go back. So if you look at this early work on using GPs, that early work was actually focused on on linear PDs with rough coefficients. So coefficients in L infinity of the domain. So those coefficients can in particular be, be, uh, uh, be discontinuous. And the basic idea is to use uh, an underlying kernel that is adapted to your solution space. And so, so for this application, we used uh, the Green's function of the PD itself as the kernel, if the PD is elliptic. Now, uh, if you take nonlinear elliptic PDEs, if you just replace this Laplacian by something like divergence A grad U, where you allow A to be discontinuous, 
then if you instead of using a smooth kernel, you use the Green's function of the uh, linear part. So here the Green's function would be continuous, but not smooth. The method will still work. Now, if you go to PDEs that start developing singularities, such as uh, the uh, Berger's equation or iconals, but with uh, zero viscosity, then these methods will eventually break down as they start developing those singularities. Why? Because you, what breaks down is the assumption that the solution belongs to the uh, uh, RKH space defined by the kernel, right? Now, to avoid this breakdown, what you need is to find a kernel such that its RKHS space contains the solution. So if you have PDEs that start developing shock or singularities, uh, there is no free lunch. You have to uh, basically find a way to inform your kernel about that. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Any other question? So I have a quick question. Um, and thank you for the great presentation. It was very informative for me. Uh, so my question is that uh, about the kernel function. And sometimes when we actually include the kernel function into the classical optimization problem, uh, like the problem became, becomes like a non-convex and we should use the uh, convexification methods, for example, an application of the uh, SOS one and SOS number two. And uh, so uh, my a specific question is that, do you know the another function with the same uh, functionality of the kernel function, the kernel, uh, but the, with the simplest actually shape and uh, uh, that uh, without uh, uh, much difficulties, then be incorporated in the, into the optimization problem. Uh, I, I couldn't hear you well. Can, can, can you repeat the question? Uh, my question is that about the uh, kernel functions. Uh, so when we actually include the kernel function into the optimization problem, some uh, it- so uh, I, I, Are you referring to uh, Bayesian optimization, things like that? Yeah. Okay. And you're, you're asking if you use an informed kernel, I going is your optimization problem to call, to be more, your optimization algorithm going to be more efficient? More, no, no NP-hard and non-convex. And uh, so my question is that, is there another function as a replacement of the kernel functions? So uh, uh, that can be substituted in this actually, uh, idea in, in, in this model. Is that possible or not? Well, I'm, I'm still not understanding the question. Here's Maybe you want to, how about Master, you just write it uh, in an email and ask him because yeah, I, I have a difficulty yeah. with your audio also. Um, Maybe maybe uh, we can take that offline and you can add, because I have difficulty hearing you too. Um, any other question? I have a question for you. So this learning the kernel, so a good kernel is that it's not so sensitive to the data. So basically we'll, if you have a good kernel, we work in the data poor regime. But how, how much data do we need to learn the kernel itself in the kernel flow, right? So I think that's the question, right? Is that algorithm itself data hungry? Uh, that's a good question. We don't really have a quantification for this. Uh, I, I mean, there is a, let, let me show you this. Uh, uh, so in this paper mm -hmm. with Yifan Chen and Andrew, we have the quantification of this for one particular example, right? Where we try to approximate the solution of a fractional Laplacian on the torus from the observation of its values at a finite number of points on the torus. And we refine those points, right? We assume the power in the fractional Laplacian to be unknown. So we can use, we don't really know which kernel to, to select. And here we compare MLE with kernel flows. 
-hmm. And uh, the, the moral of the story is that you essentially get some kind of rate of convergence, right? So KNF law will, what you see is that KNF law will improve the interpolation at, for any number of data points. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that you see is that, as I mentioned before, Emily is going to be optimal in L2 if you, if you family of parameterized kernels is well specified. But KNFLOW is going to give you the fastest rate of convergence. Mm -hmm. That's okay. the difference. So the short answer to your question is, is it data hungry? Not really, because it, it, it will add for any number of points. Of, so obviously, this number of points should not be two or five, or something greater than this. Mm -hmm. For any number of data points, this thing is going to improve your, the, your generalization right. above, mm -hmm. or the accuracy that you get on testing points. OK. Yep. Uh, so we are out of time. I have actually a lot more questions I'll, I can ask you offline. But uh, is there any other question from the audience? Um, let me mention one thing, because you, you sure. mentioned that learning the kernel can, is robust with respect to the data. You mentioned <laughs> okay. that, right? Sure. Yeah. yeah. This is not completely true in the setting of, uh, of deep learning. So. I didn't cover this, but let, let me just mention this okay. because I think this is an, uh, an important. So I, I just show you one thing. Sure. So you can you can actually show that performing interpolation with uh, with ResNet with something like ResNet is equivalent to performing interpolation with a data dependent kernel known as a warp kernel where you take a given kernel K and you apply that kernel K to a warping of the underlying space. And that warping is data dependent. Mm -hmm. now, one thing that we know about, so essentially you are being a Bayesian with a data dependent prior. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we know about Bayesian inference is that it is not robust with respect to the selection of the prior. That's Therefore, right. when you use deep learning to learn your kernel, uh, it comes at, at the cost of some non-robustness. And we're already familiar with this non-robustness results in deep learning, but you can attach them with the non-robustness results that exist in Bayesian inference. Yep. That's it. That was the comment that I wanted. Okay. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great comment. Um, all right. Well, that, uh, thank you again, Human. Really appreciate your time and, uh, for the excellent presentation. I'm just gonna stop recording here.